Oh, hi. Wow, how funny this is. Look, there's a camera. I love when people do this to start videos. Oh, hi. Like they're not aware of what's happening. Hey, it's Mr. Lynch. I'm in beautiful uh, Costa Rica in Central America. It's blazing heat. Every single day is like maybe uh, mid-90s it's been and incredibly humid. This is not my temperature. Uh, those of you that know me know that I like it cold. So I'm actually happy that this part of the trip is coming to a close, even though it's been a wonderful experience. I mean, look at this place. It's absolute uh, paradise in the jungle, very remote location. The closest kind of tourist town is about a half an hour away, a place called Hako that I was lucky enough to be in about five years ago. But this is a really cool um, big property called the Mauser Foundation. It's massive. Uh, there's eight other artists here from around the world, um, all over the place. I've made some great friends um, already in the last almost two weeks that I've been here. Let me show you what I've been working on. Come with me, come with me to my super cool little studio here. Here we go. I'll put my coffee down. I'm going to give you a little tour of what I've been working on the last maybe about 10 or 11 days I've had to paint. Um, and we'll talk specifics. I'll tell you like where all these ideas come from, uh, why, like the method to the madness, you know, like the tricks of the trade. Uh, I can even tell you what kind of brushes I've been using, what materials I'm using, um, how I traveled with these, like all kinds of stuff. I used to be really curious in college, of course, one of my favorite professors that you've heard me talk about a lot is Joe Pacillo. He just passed away, RIP, Professor Pacillo. He was incredible. Um, and he was a little secretive sometimes. I would ask him about his techniques and he would say, tricks of the trade, my young friend. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share everything. Um, including the fact that what I'm painting on here is a little bit of happenstance, but also um, a good choice for my needs here. It's, it's randomly fluorescent orange paper that is sign maker's material. Miss um, Baumgarten, you've also heard me talk about her a lot. She's a retired art teacher, a great friend of mine. I worked with her for many years. Her husband is also very creative, Mr. Baumgarten, and uh, he was working at a sign maker's shop. They were getting rid of some paper, and he said, hey, maybe, uh, maybe Mr. Lynch will want this. And sure enough, it, it fit the bill, because I knew I wanted to work big, but you know, when you're traveling, you have to travel light. So all of these, this is about 50 feet worth of paintings, and they all fit in this tiny little tube that I have attached with rubber bands and uh, carabiners to clip to my backpack and then the airlines were kind enough to let me um, stash it at the front of the airplane. So let's see. So much to talk about. Let's start with this random one. We have, as always, I think over the years I've developed this kind of hodgepodge style that comes from a lot of my favorite artists that I've uh, looked at when I was learning about painting, right? Um, James Rosenquist being one. He's got an iconic painting called the F-111 that you should look up if you've never seen it. Um, it's like a classic of pop art. I saw it in MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, up close, and it was like getting punched in the face by excellence. That's a good quote. I mean, it was like, it's shocking how huge this thing is. It's so big that it wraps around the walls of an entire room, like unbelievable. So like here I am thinking that like, oh, that's a lot of work. Well, that's nothing compared to a guy like James Rosenquist, who used to be a former billboard painter. Let me take a sip of coffee, hold on. So, some of these images are completely random, uh, right? Like, they come out of nowhere. Other things are pure mark making. In fact, let me tell you, let me back up. How these are started is complete mark making. So, I'll show you one of the materials I brought with me. is a little, um, I think it's called like a carpenter's crayon. I don't even really know what it is. It's almost like a Conti crayon from an art store. It's like a more dense version of a Crayola crayon and somehow it's um, water, water soluble too. So I started literally scribbling on these orange sheets. Once I figured out how to hang these things up, I was thinking I could use thumbtacks, but the walls are cement, so no luck there. So um, just taped them up and you can see behind uh, a lot of the paint layers, there's tiny little, literally scribbles, just Almost like in the first days of APR when we start experimenting with mark making. And of course, I 
I know that although I'm painting for myself, I'm also painting for you, students, and also my future students. So I was trying to think in terms of AP art to a large extent, not 100%, but a large extent. Like, what do you guys have to do? What are your challenges? You know, so I tried to go and find some of the same challenges. So like, you'll see these little marks showing through all over. The next step was my supply choices were limited, which a lot of you feel the same way. So like I ordered from a, a art supply store in San Jose, which is a massive city, but it's like three and a half hours away. Just a small set of acrylics, um, red, yellow, blue, black, white and some paint markers, which are something I adore, really handy. And a couple of cans of spray paint. Everything else I had to just, just like scavenge. There's no local stores uh, nearby. We're really, really remote in the jungle here. So, and it's really humid, as you can see by how rusty all these paints are. But anyways, there's a bunch of old house paint. So I was like, ah, oh, perfect. It's all water-based. So I used that and a little scraper that I packed with me. You know, you can scrape with anything, but I love these. You can get them at the dollar store, hardware store whatever. So that's the second layer. After the scribbles, there's a bunch of just mark making absolute abstraction. No ideas for imagery yet. Um, and I'm putting together a time lapse of all these paintings too, so you'll start to see like how they were made, you know, from start to finish. So that's layer number two. Finally, layer number three, I start to get a little bit more specific in terms of um, organizing spaces. So random shapes start to come up. Almost like, um, a lot of times they're rectangles. You know, and that reminds me of nowadays when you scroll through, through social media, like say you're on Instagram and you're just flipping, it's like new image, new image, new image, new like constantly, right? But they're kind of like in rectangle or square format. So that's a pretty common thing for me. So that's maybe step three. I start to put together some backgrounds that I know different uh, images will start to come up and uh, develop, right? So that's maybe step three. I think what happens next is after that, I start to see things in some of those paint blurbs that I've put down. Some of that mess starts to look like an image to me. So for example, in this one, there was just a scrape of black going down and it had a couple, like right here, you can see there's three little empty spots, just the way it worked. And it reminded me of a nutcracker. Um, you know, we're just getting out of the holiday season. So it reminded me of like a, like a Christmas decoration, a holiday decoration. And so I started to paint that. Here's the funny part. I hated it. It was just, you know, I was doing it out of my imagination. Sometimes that's great, sometimes not so great. In this case, I looked at it and it was like, oh, terrible. So I got rid of it. I just, you know, dipped my brush in some white paint and just got rid of it. And then that, in that um, erasure, I guess I would call it, well, in APR terms, revision, I saw this strange looking profile. I always happen to see profiles. Um, in shapes a lot. It's something I go back to again and again and again. In fact, even just in like, these quick little, you know, this couple feet of painting, there's a profile, there's a profile, uh, here's a profile, here's another profile. I do it again and again and again. So anyways, um, and this character reminds me something like you would see in an old style cartoon from like the 50s. I was thinking almost like Beetle Bailey, uh, which is an old, an old uh, cartoon strip, comic strip I used to like when I was a kid. But it also looks like a prospector, like someone, someone from the gold rush, but he looks like he's not quite well. <laughs> and so that's one of my keys. I like, to, I like to make myself laugh a little bit. So this guy is curious to me. Like if this is not something I'm like, oh my gosh, look how good I can draw. That, not about that at all. That's just a bizarre uh, creation that I made up. And he's got, again, from my childhood, I think this is a reference to like the Royal Order of the Buffaloes from the Flintstones. It's that kind of a hat. Also maybe like the Swedish chef from the Muppets show, that kind of a chef's hat. So it's a very strange character for sure. Now, one of my ways of thinking about this stuff is it can't just be all imagination. It can't just be all uh, slop. Uh, like I always tell you guys, I think one of the best simple formulas for making art, uh, at least in AP art terms, is a lot of experimentation, a lot of playfulness, but also some kind of skill. So that's where this fork comes in, which is not exactly hyper-realistic, but pretty close to being realistic. Um, and I just took a picture of the for a fork that we were using to eat with on the balcony upstairs, which is quite beautiful. And the sun is so intense, it was casting this really long shadow. And the background is complete abstraction, again, playing around with one of the many, many rules of APR, line weight, right? So that's uh, line quality. 
these lines are constantly going from thick to thin, even though it's just a scribble. It's kind of like a, let's call it like a learned scribble. You know, it's, a, it's something that is not like a two-year-old scribble, but someone that's been looking at art their whole lives and practicing art their whole lives. Um, other than that, there's lots and lots of different layers. Um, I like to use a lot of stencils, uh, and I find these stencils anywhere. This was like a bin from the dollar store, like a plastic uh, container that I just cut apart and used with spray paint to get some very pop artish, um, you know, um, I love polka dots. I don't know where that comes from. I think it comes from being a kid and looking at branding and packaging and finding um, uh, the beauty, <laughs> the strange beauty of like the Wonder Bread package from when I was a kid. I don't even know if they still make that synthetic bread, but it's uh, when I was a kid, I loved those dots, something about it. So you'll notice those polka dots everywhere. Uh, in terms of specificity, again, this is a hilarious photo. I always say, you've heard me say this before, the better the photo, the better the painting has the potential to be. That's a, one of my favorite pictures of my lifelong buddy Jim acting silly on purpose. Look at that face. Um, at a hotel room we were at in Toronto, uh, his, he was turning 40. His wife knows that we're lifelong friends and she said, hey, I think for his 40th birthday I'm going to send you guys on a trip. Where do you want to go? So we picked Toronto and he was acting silly in the hotel room, like dancing around on, on purpose, like, like a fool. And we took a picture that we both laughed, at, laughed about that photo until we cried. So it looked like he was holding something. Now, I was kind of satisfied with the way his hands and, and arms were painted. So I didn't want to make him holding something because it would have covered those up. So I came up with this simple idea. I love little strings attached to things in my paintings. So these look like, uh, it looks like he's playing a weird game of Cat's Cradle with almost like abacus beads or something on there. Now I had the potential to, you know, let's show some light and shadow, let's show some rendering of form, again, AP art terms, uh, with those spheres. I could have made them look 3D, but I was kind of satisfied in the fact that they're just flat, like no attempt made at making them 3D. It's like almost like that's not the point. Uh, there's another, you've heard me talk about one of my earliest artistic influences, a guy named Ben Sean. He's the one that kind of first blew my mind when I came across his book um, in my local library downtown, Niagara Falls, probably in like 11th grade. He's the one that like really, really lit a fire in me about like wanting to know about art. Um, and he's got a famous painting about a guy playing Cat's Cradle. So maybe that was in the back of my head. Another thing you see here, um, I don't do it a lot in this series of paintings. I think more at home, I'll do more of it, but there's often writing in here. I like this cursive writing. I don't know if that comes from Andy Warhol's script or what, um, but this one is a funny one that says, I do not, very light, very hard to see on purpose. I do not fit your, and then a bad uh, pun, like a bad dad joke, form you lie. And that comes from Burgess Meredith, uh, famous actor. He was like Rocky's coach in the original Rocky movies, but he's, you know, lifelong actor. So um, he was in a famous uh, Twilight Zone episode, one of my all-time favorite TV shows, um, playing the role of a librarian that was deemed obsolete. And so when he's kind of fighting back against the state, he, he says, Ah, oh, I do not fit your formulae. So somehow that came into my head. Uh, there's yet another sneaky profile up here in Hiding in Jim's very abstracted shadow. I should also tell you that I use these forms a lot too, these kind of thorny, uh, thick to thin lines. Again, line weight, line variation. Um, but that's, in this particular case, I feel like that's coming from being in the, in the jungle here. Like, all of these plants are like really, really, really made to defend themselves. Okay, so we um, no, mostly have just been here painting, but we've also taken a few little road trips. And one of them was to like a local uh, rodeo, which was incredible. I'll, uh, I'll show you that in a second, but this is one of the horse riders from the, from the rodeo. Um, but on the way there, we stopped at a little, little local um, market, really tiny local market, and there was this kind of uh, like a food cart, so like a street vendor. And I don't even really know what this says. If you, if you speak Espanol, maybe you can tell me what it says. I think it's something about like warm palm fruits, possibly, I think. Um, but it was just a curiosity that I, you know, I, I took a lot of pictures, of course, while I'm here, and then I look through those pictures to find materials to use, like, or images, rather, to use in the paintings. Now, that one specifically is floating there, but in heavy perspective, right? So that is um, showing a sense of depth, 
which is again one of the AP art rules. These paintings are not like windows into a world where there's like traditional perspective. That is one way of painting, right? Like here you got a horizon line, you got things going back in a distance, you got things in the distance are small, things are close are huge. I don't have that, um, but I do have lots of places where those types of perspective are shown. Like this is supposed to reference two walls in like very, very extreme perspective, right? Like here's one wall, here's another wall, like the ceiling, you know. These lines are start off thicker and get thinner as you go. You can, all, you can literally see sweat on my hand, not to gross you out, but that's how hot it is here. There's no AC in this place, which is, I'm survived, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I've, I've survived it so far. Uh, the hook, the hook is a random little thing I drew last night that is, if I had to be judgmental, my least favorite part of all of these paintings. I kind of, you know, it's funny when you're being creative, you take a chance, you have to take a risk. I took a risk, it's like, hmm, kind of liked it better before. So I always say to you guys, there's no such thing as bad painting, it's just not finished yet. So I could say, all right, not finished, I'll change this when I get home, like my trip is up tomorrow. So, um, you know, but I'm taking these home with me, obviously, I can keep on painting on these as long as I want to. So it doesn't, it's not like it's concrete. But uh, I don't know why, it's just that doesn't do it for me. The theory behind it is good. I wanted to draw, uh, I wanted to do a line drawing that you could see through, right? So instead of just like black pen on white paper, it's a, you know, strange blue, you know, pretty saturated but dark value, blue paint marker that you can see through to all the mark making underneath. So that part I like. But just something about the placement of it, I don't know. I just preferred it before. Anyways, that came from my little sketchbook here that I draw a lot of times when I'm just thinking of odd ideas, like, you know, just free association stuff. Things just pop into your head. And sometimes you love them, sometimes not as much. Um, and often I'll draw them in the airplane, especially when I'm traveling. So that one came from a drawing on the airplane, even with the turbulence. Uh, this is just a view out of my window, again, to show some forms and light and shadow and a little bit of perspective. These are just like our local, you know, there's, everything is really, really earthy here. So, you know, there's barely even a washing machine. It's like you wash things by hand, you put them out to dry. So, um, yeah, there's outside my bedroom window, like when I'm waking up, I see, well, in fact, I'll show you really quick. There's uh, a view out of my window, forgive my mess, but you already know that, of a clothesline. And you can just see, I guess someone just took it all down, but there's usually laundry on there. Another thing, I know I'm rambling here, forgive me, but another thing is that object, whatever that is, I think it's like a day bed that they said someone gifted them, like you're supposed to, almost like a hammock, like you're supposed to sit in there in the shade and swing. So that thing, again, something I woke up looking at every day, uh, became this thing. I started to work with that shape, right? And I'm trying to show again, light and shadow. So I kind of imagined it as a really, really 3D form. And then I decided to elaborate on that idea and turn it into almost like a, it looks like a Turkish lamp or something. Some people here said it looked like a birdhouse uh, with those holes in it. Um, and then this uh, string, again, for line weight purposes, there's a string that wraps all around going from thick to thin constantly. And that's done with a 15 millimeter paint marker. That turns into a flag that very poorly on purpose says lava car. So here's the story on lava car. When I showed up here and was picked up by my host from the airport, you know, you just are transported into this totally other world, right? Let me take a quick sip of coffee. So like, it always blows my mind, air travel. You live your regular life, you go to the airport, you sit on a tube that flies in the air for a few hours, this is basically like the length of going to Florida from where we live twice. It takes about, I, I couldn't even tell you, I had to connect to North Carolina, but it's not a super far away place. But anyways, when you arrive, you're in such a foreign world. It's like a shock almost. So everything is fascinating. Everything is different. Everything is like fresh and new. And one of the first things I saw were these bed sheets blowing in the breeze on sticks that say lava car. Sometimes they say things like lava car mic. Um, like this one, I turned it to a Mike's photo mat. Maybe I'll explain that if I remember. Um, so lava car, I asked uh, my host, I said, I don't get it, but I love it. What is lava car? It's everywhere. It'll be written on huge tires, like half buried. 
in the dirt and half sticking out. Like they, the people here are very resourceful. There's not a lot of, you can't just go to the local hardware store here. It doesn't exist. It's not easy to find things here. So they make do with whatever they can get their hands on. Um, again, not to overstate it, but like we are really remote here in the jungle. Not a lot of, there's probably only like seven or eight houses for miles. Um, so anyways, uh, lava car she said is uh, car wash. <laughs> lava, I guess is wash in Spanish. Again, forgive my pronunciation, it's not my thing, but. Um, so this is also, speaking of school, this is a silly, silly, silly picture based on my awesome old student, AP art student, Noah Wisniewski, which you might, some of you might know him. And uh, we were fooling around one day and he took one of the still life objects uh, from class, a pine cone, and tied it around his neck and we were laughing. It was kind of toward the end of the school year, just being silly. So of course I asked him if I could take his picture and then what, two, three years later, that image became food for, that photograph became food for this image, which is an exaggeration and an abstraction of that pine cone uh, going up off into space, like almost like a fox tail in reverse, like really, really large. And the, I think his shoe is also a joke on, on our weird American <laughs> style. Like one of my other incredibly great students, Nate Riley was uh, a fan of his uh, sneakers, you know, his footwear. And I remember he had a, like a really covered in pair of Nikes and they said foam on them, which always made me giggle. So to me, this is like a cloud you know, almost like a pastry too, <laughs> which makes no logical sense, but there's lots of awesome local pastries here when we do get out to the grocery store. So that kind of reminds me of that. Um, that brings me to my trips out to Los Angeles where one of their iconic restaurants is called Bob's Big Boy. In fact, one of my favorite artists, um, visual artist, musical artist, and incredibly legendary filmmaker with the same last name as me, Mr. David Lynch, he was notorious for, before he kind of made it big, um, he would go and have a milkshake at Bob's Big Boy in Burbank, California, near LA, uh, every single day and kind of like sit there and work on ideas. So that is Bob's Big Boy. That's there for skill as well, right? So it's a balance between some slop and some skill, hopefully. Um, that's pretty what I would call painterly. It's got some drips in there, but definitely showing form, lots and lots of light and shadow, right? Um, and then these random boxing gloves. I was thinking about, okay, the weird, the brain works in weird ways. I was thinking about why do I like lettering so much? I always have a lot of lettering in these works. Again, maybe not so much in this one. Like they're not, it's not really abundant in this one, but like, okay, so we can say the three here is a bit of lettering, right? We can say the formulae and the cursive is lettering. We can say this is lettering. We can say the 86 and the hook is lettering. So maybe there's more than I realized actually. Um, even the Burger King logo, which is hilarious. So um, why lettering? And I thought back uh, to a movie that was huge when I was a kid. I think it came out in 77. I was born in 74. It was Rocky, right? Rocky was an, an incredibly powerful story. So I think that I remember being young and being fascinated by Rocky's Everlast logo that was on like the waist of his, his uh, shorts. I, if I remember right, I might be making that up. But I think that's a boxing logo from, you know, decades ago, but it was kind of shaped like a bow tie. And I always thought that was really interesting how the letters went from big to small like that. You know, some iconic designer came up with that. It's like somebody's graphic design study planted that little seed in my young brain, right? It's not like it comes from nowhere. So I think that's what the boxing gloves are referenced to, but then also this, these arms that are very surrealistically floating off of his head, it's almost like at the end of the movie when Rocky's like got his hands up in victory, but it's also a reference to the amount of incredibly alien insects that are in this place. Like every night I'm visited by, because I leave the door open because it's so hot, right? So every night these insane insects come in here, like a billion praying mantises, huge moths, um, even like leaf bugs that I've never seen in person before, that I've only ever seen in like National Geographic magazines growing up. They've been coming to visit. And then a few nights ago, there's a huge black beetle. I don't know what it's called, but it's got these incredibly long, powerful, like pinchers up top. Again, I've only seen it in pictures before. So that's kind of a reference to that. Uh, what else can I show you? Oh, back here. So at our local rodeo, we saw 
um, the locals were wearing whatever that culture is. I don't know, and I'm trying to be as respectful to it as possible, but it was fascinating how different I was dressed compared to how different the locals were dressed. And all the people at the, lo at the rodeo were wearing these massive kind of cowboy hats, but with a twist, like they were made out of red felt with like bright green uh, ropes around them and really extravagant. So that's, a ref that's from a photo I took of a guy with that hat on that was talking on a phone. Um, and then the funniest part is there's only one little local restaurant in, nearby. And we went there a few nights ago. Our water was shut off. Um, they were working on the water supply here. So like randomly, we had no water for a bunch of hours in a row, which is kind of scary because it's so hot here. You definitely need to drink your water. So um, anyways, we had no choice but to walk. About a mile through the jungle, there's a, a local restaurant that was delicious. It's almost like you're going to some, somebody's house for home cooking. It was like that kind of an experience. Nothing commercialized about this place. But really, really awesome. And that was the first television set I've seen since I've been here. This is really kind of off the grid here. I keep on saying that, so forgive me. But, um, but anyway, so on TV, you know, soccer, as they call it here, football, but soccer is massive everywhere. You know, it's like we have it too, of course, but it's massive around the world. I don't think generally Americans like it quite as much. Um, and so to me, it's a little foreign, right? I was, so that was on the TV and I just got such a kick out of the pop art aspect of it. I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know the language. And I see a referee wearing like a tight yellow shirt and I'm like, what's on his back? I can't see. It doesn't say ref, it doesn't say anything. It just says Burger King. <laughs> In this really, really perfectly pop art moment, I was like, that is hilarious to me. I love it. So I snuck that Burger King logo in here. In terms of mark making, I painted it, you know, pretty accurately, not like super accurately, but like pretty accurately. And then I took a scraper to it just before it dried to get to kind of weather it a little bit. So everything here is weathered anyway, so that helps with the mark making. Like things decay and rust here so fast with the laser beam power of the sun and the incredible humidity. All right, um, back to kind of a quality image or skill based. This is a photo that I used, it's not mine, but I used with permission from my lifelong friend Bob and uh, an awesome other friend named Jenny who have recently kind of fallen in love with each other and they're like in pure bliss right now. So they posted this on social media. Jenny, I've known for a long time. She took my um, night painting class I used to teach at Buffalo Art Studio. Just incredible, joyful, caring soul. Bob's the same way, but I know him through music. He's an amazingly skilled, creative uh, musician that I've worked with a lot over the years. And he's also an archaeologist, which I'll, kind of fits for, uh, you know, where I'm at too. So anyways, that's just like literally a photo from, I don't remember, Facebook, Instagram, something. And I wrote Bob and said, you know, would you mind if I used your image there? And he was like, you know, I, I think Jenny said, if you do it, make us look weird. So I tried my best. Uh, this is a joke, an inside joke. I bought a pair, you know, when you travel, you try to make sense of like, what should I wear? What makes sense? You know, I don't know what the laundry situation is here, which like I just told you basically is washing your clothes in the sink and hanging it to dry. So I bought this pair of quote unquote travel pants that uh, my love Catherine was making fun of me. She said, you look like MC Hammer or something. It looks like you're wearing like genie pants. So they're like these big billowy pants with like tight ankles. It's hilarious. They fit kind of poorly. So that's just an abstract mark that reminded me of a leg with a kneecap. So then I turned that into a long boot, again, a little joke from my childhood, like a tube sock, um, a random like Peter Pan looking shoe. And because I'm a fan of retro, I made it into a Sacconi. Um, this is a pepper that a local guy gave me, a guy named Tobin that I just met, and he grew a bunch of peppers, so he gave me one as a gift. Um, these are, this is the illusion of um, a rendering of form, rather, is what I'm trying to say. Even though they look pretty abstract, there's definite lights and shadows on there. And that's from a local hotel that I went and got a Diet Coke on the beach. It was so delicious. Um, and then on the bar, I saw like just a stack of colorful plastic cups. Something about it appealed to me. I took a picture um, and threw that in here. This is a reference to an old place on the east side of Buffalo that's been around forever. It's called like Darren's Tavern. And I came across it on a, on a place called the Forgotten Buffalo Tours. The east side of Buffalo used to be incredibly um, populated and over the 
last, I don't know, 50 years or so, it's been in kind of a state of decline. Maybe there's areas that are coming back now. People realize there's opportunity. Uh, so this old, this old tavern, there's a woman that runs it called Renata. She's German, speaks very broken English. She's a super stern, kind of hard worker. And it's really, really empty. So sometimes Catherine and I will go there, play pool, and then they have a really antiquated jukebox there. And since, like I said, no one's in there, just to be polite, we would say, like, Renata, what do you like to hear, you know? Uh, and she'd say, my favorite is Harry Belafonte, the old Caribbean singer. So there's Harry Belafonte, and get ready for a dad joke. Sometimes when you play that music in public, sometimes, especially younger people like me playing my classroom music, sometimes people say, Lynch, that stuff is cheesy. So that's a bad joke, like a little piece of Swiss cheese. Uh, when I started this, I was thinking of it as being like an arcade game from my youth, but then it, I stretched it out just to kind of fill the space in an interesting way. I pushed the perspective of it to show, again, the illusion of depth, another AP term. And I gave it like all these wonky, um, like almost joystick handles that make no logical sense, but they're kind of fun to look at. I don't know what this is. It's those thick to thin kind of teardrop, raindrop shapes again that I often, often go to. But it also reminds me of um, a little Christmas tree that Catherine and I uh, like. It's like a little white synthetic tree that we put up every year. I don't know why, but this is like rolling out the welcome mat. Uh, to me, it's almost like uh, welcome, right? So, but it also looks a little bit like a yoga mat, and that's just a good way of showing, again, perspective and the illusion of depth and also form, right? Rendering a form. And then because, again, this place is uh, the land of nature, um, and they're very, very eco-sensitive here, so maybe the opposite of that is like chopping down trees. So there's these kind of synthetic-looking tree stumps that I, I was thinking of as almost like little seats near the jukebox, even though, again, physically they don't make sense, but that's the way that my weird artist brain can work sometimes. And they have these very, very simplistic, like, no frills, no, uh, no details, um, tree forms. Like, from our, from our walks in the jungle here, you often, you often see things that are striving to get sunlight, so they'll grow really tall and thin, and then explode, like, really, really high up in the air, so they can maximize their their growth, I guess, right? Another bad pun on the side of this jukebox um, is from my sketchbook on the airplane. Who knows where these ideas come from? Uh, David Lynch, the guy I just told you about, uh, wrote a book, something called like Fishing for the Big Idea. I forget exactly the title of it. Um, cap catching the Big Fish, something like that. So this Capital Gains guy just like popped into my head, and it's a bad joke. It's like the shape of his baseball hat is shaped like the U.S. Capitol Dome. That's for Mr. O'Donnell. Um, and then capital gains is what happens when you, uh, let's say, you sell your house. You have to pay taxes on the profit that you've made from your house appreciating in value. For example, that's capital gains. Um, but also, it's a reference to Capitol Records in Los Angeles that they always call the house that Nat King Cole built because he sold so many records. They built that iconic tower that's shaped like a stack of records that you see in all the promotions for Los Angeles as a city, one of my favorite cities. Um, so here we have like a guy on the side of a jukebox, almost like an advertisement for a pop star, but um, a non-existent pop star and, and, a, and a very odd pop star. This is another one I'm not crazy about the expression or something, but it's fine. It's okay. It's not like I have to be in love with every aspect of all these paintings, right? Um, I know, I'm getting long-winded here. Let's see what else I can show you. Oh, so Photomat, when I was a kid, like pre-digital cameras, used to be these tiny little kiosks that were really, really small, like, I don't know, maybe like 10 foot by 10 foot only. And you would, you would drive up to them, they were in the middle of the parking lot, and you would get your film developed. You'd show up and like, you know, they'd say like, come back in an hour and we'll have your pictures ready for you. So Photomats were these little tiny red and yellow booths. So when I was at the beach the other day in the beautiful Pacific Ocean, like seriously paradise, I saw like a beach tent in the sun, way in the distance, took a picture of it, painted it, even though I'm, I'm dying to have a cadmium red, something bright, I just don't have a bright red with me. So it's this kind of muted magenta, but it is what it is. Uh, and then I put a very, very synthetic looking flag on here that says, photo mat, and a really, I used the word before, but wonky, I love the word wonky. It's a really wonky type face. Uh, and Mike's is a reference to Mike's lava car. 
uh, or a lava car mic that I just told you about. Here we have a headlamp. Everyone here, when they have to walk in the jungle at night, everyone wears headlamps. You just have no other choice. There's no street lights. So this is a headlamp kind of illuminating some growth. Maybe it's like cactus paddles or something. Uh, here is a beautiful, very synthetically painted again, flower. I decided to do a combination of kind of light and shadow and showing form, but also a really specific, almost pop art, almost cartoonish blue outline. Although with that outline, I did do line weight. So thick to thin lines all the time, casting a really dramatic shadow of like almost black, but then leaving a little bit of mark making too. And that flower is just something that comes from this trip right outside my door. I don't know what kind of a flower this is, but they're all over the property. Really, really a beautiful thing. So that's there. So that showed up. It's funny how things just kind of show up. And finally, the horse and the rider. That's like I said, from the rodeo. Um, truth be told, I didn't like the way her face turned out. So what do you do? Do you just complain and say, oh, this is not going well? No, you have to go for plan B. So plan B was, let's give her a toucan mask. There's actually toucans flying all over this property too, which is so cool to see. You know, like most of us have only ever seen it from like a cereal box. It's rare to see a cool bird like that in person. So, and then I thought, well, she has one. Maybe her buddy, the horse has one too, even though his is like, uh, once again, like one of the other images they just showed you, but I didn't want to cover up all of his face. So it's like his is in the process of being put on. And then just to play around with depth, um, again, like kind of like an Ill, to create an illogical space because there's no illusion of depth here in terms of one point perspective or two point perspective, anything like that. So it's kind of a funny joke to, to show on purpose how flat this image is, almost like as if this is uh, like a sheet of paper or I mean, it could be a form too, but floating only like a few inches over like a wall. So it's casting a heavy shadow that makes again, no logical sense. Whereas this one, is actually kind of how the sun was hitting that tent and, and casting that shadow kind of in real life. And then so I referenced that idea up here in the photo mat too, also to get a little bit of um, uh, a little bit of mark making in there. Um, is that what I was trying to say? I think I saw this and got distracted. That's my mark making. Um, I don't remember what I was trying to say here. Oh, contrast. That's all. I was trying to get some contrast in there because it was otherwise it was like white on top of light yellow. So there wasn't a lot of contrast. So I think that might be it for my little tour of about 50 feet of paintings. I know that's really, really long winded. I hope you learned something from it um, as you guys continue on your incredible artistic journeys. Like I always tell you, art is a class you take in high school and yet it's so much more. It can be your life's work. It could be your life's pursuit. It can be a way of approaching the world, which is how it has worked for me. I love being an artist. I love making things. I love learning about it. I love trying it. I've never gotten over the thrill of making something and stepping back and kind of thinking about what did I just do? Uh, it's a game, but it's also, you've got to look and learn and think and grow. It's a, it's a game and a journey, I guess. Um, and lastly, I, here I am in a, in a residency, right? So what you can do, there are places around the world um, and even locally that you can apply to, you know, you have to send them pictures of what you do and kind of a justification for what makes you worthy almost. Um, and if you're lucky, you'll get chosen to like be a member here. So there's eight of us here. There's um, a couple people from Toronto, which is randomly close to home. There's a couple of people, uh, there's someone from New Mexico, which is uh, the only other person from the States. There's someone um, nearby anyways, that's from Holland. There's someone here also from Amsterdam, there's someone here from, or there's two people here from the United Kingdom that are just both awesome. Um, it's just a wonderful thing. So anyways, you can go to these places and you can stay at like a kind of a discounted rate, but different than a hotel room, the expectation is it's an artist thing. So like I have my room, don't, uh, don't be disgusted by my mess, but you've seen my desk before. So I have my room with that cool handmade bed, by the way. And then I have the studio right next door. Like, man, I keep on saying the same thing. Like, pinch me. This is like a dream come true for me. I love this. Oh, one last thing. Um, this, this string of lights is from all of the different little festivals we've seen around. And then this uh, kind of poorly drawn collection or painted collection of uh, forms is a reference to this guy's mom when we were growing up. 
that would be the wonderful Mrs. Zito, who's so good to us growing up. Uh, she used to play this handheld video game called, um, it was like an early version of the game Columns. And uh, I always remember she really enjoyed it. It was like a great pastime for her. So that's a little reference to Mrs. Zito in there. So these things are almost like flypaper for ideas, right? There's not one, I don't start this knowing what's going to happen. I enjoy the process of discovering what could happen uh, and telling little stories that don't make linear sense. And that comes from a lot of different places. Uh, Robert Rauschenberg is one. James Rosenquist, who I already mentioned, is another. Um, but then also a legendary kind of avant-garde, uh, well, they call them like French New Wave uh, film director is Jean-Luc Godard. And he's done a billion masterpieces over a really, really lengthy um, career. But uh, one of the most famous ones, surprisingly, is like a concert documentary for the Rolling Stones in the seven, or maybe late 60s, I forget, 70s or late 60s. Um, but anyways, he said, Every story has a middle, I'm um, sorry, let me try again. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. So have fun with the process of, of you know, shifting your linear uh, narrative, I guess. And so to me, that's kind of how these work. I don't have the answers. You don't necessarily have the answers, but looking at this can be a curiosity that hopefully is satisfying. And for example, if you had this in your bedroom, on your bedroom wall and you woke up in the morning, probably every morning of your life, if you saw it for years and years and years, it would look probably different to you based on what experiences you're bringing to looking at it, right? Um, lastly, this is just a, a strange joke. This sideways character reminds me a little bit of the artist Barry McGee, um, who's uh, one of my kind of more current favorites. Uh, very overly simplistic on purpose. And, but with a talking, with like a, a voice box, saying something. This person looks to me almost like that expression, like they're slightly amused and they're reporting, <laughs> reporting something to you. Uh, some kind of jungle growth here, again, showing forms. And I think with that, I'm gonna show you one last time my sweaty face and wave goodbye to you. I hope you enjoyed my little tour. Uh, forgive my tank top. <laughs> it's not a very teacher-like thing to wear, but holy hot. So I look forward to seeing you guys soon and all the best to you. Bye-bye.